the production you're going to see of The Marriage of Figaro. First of all, I'll ask you, has anybody in this gathering seen The Marriage of Figaro before? Okay, quite a few of you have. Has anybody been in it? Aha, uh -huh. I saw a couple of you that I thought have. Um, so it's a, not an unknown entity. Nevertheless, I may be covering some ground uh, that we've already covered before. As Ian said, um, he's afraid of repeating himself. I'm several times older than Ian, so I'm even more afraid of repeating myself. But the production you're going to see conjures up the visual milieu of uh, Italian cinema in the 1950s. Um, I think quite successfully. Uh, the, the costumes are quite beautiful. And also, the set is inspired by the painting of Miro. So it's a really quite a visually stunning thing to watch. But of course, the situations that are depicted in the world of the marriage of Figaro are things that recur throughout all of our history, our social history, our political history. Uh, and it is a work that is actually quite political, despite the fact that Mozart and his collaborators softened it a bit. We better get to the first name that I want to introduce you to, and that is that of Beaumarchais. Beaumarchais lived from 1732, which just to put it in context is the year Haydn was born, until 1799. Uh, and he was many things. He was not ever, he actually christened Beaumarchais with that surname. That's because he patented a device that's included to this day in wind-up watches, insofar as we have wind-up watches, that allow them to run on time for up to a year. That is something patented by somebody who lived in the 18th century in France. And so that's why he named himself that. Uh, March as well. Uh, and he also was a, a poet. He also supplied arms to um, the United States of America in their revolution of 1776. He had, he had quite a lot on the ball. What we are welcoming him here for is that he wrote a trilogy of plays, a trilogy of seditious, revolutionary, radical um, uh, indictments of the ruling class as he was experiencing it. And the first of these is called The Barber of Seville. So now I want to introduce a second person or a second event. I think I'm not the only person in the room who remembers that there was once such a thing as 1975. In 1975, a movie was released called Jaws 2. Now, you're wondering why on earth I mentioned that. Well, in one of my favorite pieces of film criticism, the writer writes, all of these people are part of, of pop society. They swallow and devour pop culture. Wouldn't they already have seen the original Jaws? And this is exactly what Mozart asked himself when he set The Marriage of Figaro. He assumed that the people in the audience would know the story of The Barber of Seville, which is the first play in Beaumarchais' trilogy, because it had been set successfully by a composer named Paisiello, who was very uh, popular at the time, uh, in 1782. Uh, Mozart moved to Vienna in 1781, and he became part of a tightly knit and very, very busy community of professional Italian opera composers. Of course, he was Austrian, but he composed Italian opera just like everybody else. It was like the movies. It would, it would be, um, that kind of entertainment would be to the Viennese theater goers what the movies were to Hollywood in the 1930s and 40s. So he could safely assume that everybody knew the plot and the characters, because most of them are trans transplanted from the Barber of Seville to the Marriage of Figaro. So I'm going to indulge myself by giving you a little bit of that plot, if that's all right. Uh, also, a lot of people who come fresh to this work, The Marriage of Figaro, assume that at some point some buffoon is going to walk on stage and start going, Figaro, Figaro. That happens in The Barber of Seville that was composed after Mozart's death by Rossini. So it ain't going to happen in this. So you can get your money back if that's why you came. Um, but however, there is a character named Figaro in it. And do you remember uh, old barber shops used to have those candy cane kind of things with red and white? That's because a, a barber in the, in the 18th century would have been expected to perform at least minor surgeries as well. So you could go get your hair cut, your beard trimmed, your appendix out. Whether you walk out of that building alive afterwards is probably 50-50. Uh, Handel's father was a barber surgeon. Uh, so that's what the Barber of Seville is. Figaro is, an, is a factotum, as he describes himself. He does everything. He knows everybody's business. He's able to help everybody out and fix every problem. Uh, and that's, that's, what he, uh, that's why he is in The Marriage of Figaro. I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Let's look at what happens in The Barber of Seville very quickly. Uh, Figaro is the man about town in Seville. And he meets a young count, generally uh, very attractive, very nice. And the young count 
has disguised himself as an impoverished student because he's fallen in love with a girl he only sees at church. And uh, she has fallen in love with him, or at least with his singing voice. And she, however, is guarded very, very, uh, she's sequestered very closely by her guardian, who is Dr. Bartolo. Dr. Bartolo uh, knows that when, when this girl comes of age, she's going to come into a very substantial amount of money, and he wants it. And so he figures uh, if he keeps her from the world, except for going to church, he'll be able to bully her into marrying him. So he'll get his hands on her money, and let's face it, on her, because she's cute. Uh, so that is his nefarious plan. So Dr. Bartolo is a dirty old man. And uh, Figaro is asked to help the Count win the hand of Rosina, which is the girl's name in real life. Rosina also has a singing teacher named Don Basilio. In this opera, as well as The Barber of Seville, Don Basilio's just a nasty old gossip. Why they have to make the music teacher one of the nasty, weaselly characters, I do not know. Um, but of course, it ends happily. Figaro helps the Count and uh, his Rosina escape, elope, and get married. And so when the uh, marriage of Figaro opens, Mozart would have been able to assume that you knew all of this background information and that Bartolo is sworn to avenge the loss of Rosina. He can't do anything to the Count. He's outranked by the Count. So he's going to take it out on Figaro. All of that sounds pretty nice, doesn't it? Now we get to the marriage of Figaro, which was described by one historian as the first and most important gesture of, towards the French Revolution. Uh, and it's, it was so controversial, it was so seditious, it was so directly uh, critical of the ruling class that all of the other rulers in Europe banned it from being performed, banned the play from being performed. And that includes the otherwise somewhat liberal Emperor Joseph that was ruling the Austrian Empire when Mozart lived in Vienna. Now, you could buy a copy of it, and somehow or another, Mozart and his collaborator thought this will be a good idea. I have to stress, it flies in the face of all the practice we know about from the 18th century. You didn't start writing an opera. That takes a lot of time and effort, unless you were assured that it would be performed. And they weren't even assured they'd be allowed to perform it in, in a basement, let alone in an opera house. But they had some things going for them. And one of them is that Emperor Joseph II liked them. He had a real eye and ear for talent, and he understood that these two theater creators were going to do a good job. Now I have to mention Mozart's collaborator. There are three operas that are the results, the fruits of the labor of Mozart and Lorenzo da Ponte. Now, you all have heard of Lorenzo da Ponte, am I correct? Do you know, would you like to know a little bit about him? Okay. It's one of the most colorful lives. It's second only to Casanova's. Um, he was born in 1749, which makes him seven years older than Mozart. And he was born in a Jewish ghetto of Venice. He had a different name. And his, fa his, he was, his mother died when he was quite young, and his father was left with three sons. And he fell in love with this a Gentile girl. And the rule was that if a Jew wanted to marry a Gentile girl, he and his family had to convert. It was that easy. So uh, he did convert, and the bishop who performed the conversion expected, because this was part of the tradition too, that one of the sons would follow into the priesthood. And therefore, this young fellow, the newly christened Lorenzo de Ponte, christened after the bishop, was taken in and educated to become a priest. In the history of the Catholic Church, there is probably nobody less suited to the priesthood than Lorenzo de Ponte. Uh, first of all, his talent and his interest and his passion was, well, one of his passions was toward literature. He had a Jesuit teacher who was brilliant at literature and uh, basically awoke in him all his love of writing and his love of words. It was said he could improvise poetry the way Mozart could improvise music, in other words, with flawless canchon and rhyme. Also, he was very interested in politics and something of a radical himself. We would call him a, a leftist. Uh, and his gift for words meant that he could express his displeasure with the status quo really effectively and with incredibly sharp, sarcastic wit. So that was another reason he wasn't really inclined to be in the priesthood. As it turns out, he was also one of these people, Wagner was another, who felt that, you know, I want what I want and why should I pay for it? So he would run up huge bills all over town and then not really intend to pay any of it back. So he sometimes got run out of the neighborhood by angry creditors. That's also not really 
uh, germane to the profession of priesthood. But best of all, he had an insatiable appetite for the ladies, particularly if they were married, or at least affianced. And so he sometimes had to leave town under cover of darkness to his cape, angry brothers and husbands and fiancés, etc. So he didn't last long in the church, and he didn't last long in, in Venice. What drove him out was a warrant for his arrest, for his pamphleteering, for the language uh, of his attacks against the ruling class. So he found himself in Vienna, very, very talented, just like Mozart was very, very talented. But there was a pecking order in the society of Italian opera professionals, and they kind of jumped the queue. So most of us, when we learn about Mozart, will be told that he was unpopular with many of his contemporaries and colleagues, and to a certain degree he was. Um, first of all, they don't like anyone jumping the queue, particularly somebody as conspicuously talented. Uh, and Mozart apparently could come off as a little bit arrogant. How wouldn't you if you've been told you're the greatest genius in history since you were four? So he was aware of how much better he was than everybody else. But he seems to have enjoyed his profession as being a professional musician in um, the greatest city of Europe, Vienna. So he and Lorenzo da Ponte set to work on the first of their three collaborations. And because Mozart and da Ponte together were able to soften some of the sharper political edges of this story, not all of them, it's, still, it's, it's unmistakable what it is, and humanize the characters. And there has never been a composer in operatic history better than Mozart that, at creating a living, breathing human being through musical moods and means, as you'll hear tonight. So they were given permission to mount this opera, The Marriage of Figaro, Le Nozze di Figaro, which was first presented in Vienna in 1786. Now, it was a, it, it, it was a success. But where it was a triumph was in Prague. So when it went there, Mozart was able to write back when he went to see it and uh, say, everybody's singing tunes from Figaro. You hear them played in the bars and in the cafes and in the restaurants and in the piazzas. If there had been elevators, they would have been playing Figaro in the elevators. Uh, so that's why he was immediately asked to present another opera and Da Ponte and Mozart created Don Giovanni for Prague. And as it happens, the first opera next season, La Clemenza di Tito, was also written specifically for Prague. So Mozart had a huge, huge following there, very enthusiastic following. So I mentioned also in the talk I gave before the preview, uh, what are the ingredients of this piece? So shall I go through some of those with you? Um, the first thing to keep in mind is that this is called an opera buffa. Uh, that means comic opera, but it means much more than that. It, it liberates the creators to experiment with uh, kind of traditional form that had become a little bit threadbare. Uh, and it also li liberated them to choose unconventional subject matter, like a very controversial contemporary play. A work that is in the category of opera Syria, like Clemenza di Tito, usually is historical or mythological. But in this case, we're tackling something with the people of Mozart's own day. So immediately, it's unconventional. And another thing that I'll just tell you and let you experience it is that during Mozart's uh, lifetime and beforehand, there was an expectation that every act in an opera, and this has four acts, every act would end with a finale. And during the finale, all the characters would appear in the order in which they had been introduced. And they would all sing. So that's pretty difficult to do in any kind of dramaturgically logical way. So Mozart and de Ponte decided immediately to do away with that. And the first thing you're going to hear is an overture. I don't know if anybody is interested in this, but the overture is in D major. And the opera finishes in D major. That's a Mozartian thing. It's not common in the 18th century. It becomes more common later on that he gives us a grounding in terms of the key. We don't even necessarily hear it, but in some way we feel it. The overture is very quick, and it's self-contained in that, A, it can be played as an independent piece and frequently is in orchestral concerts, but also it doesn't include any material that's heard later on in the opera. Don Giovanni does, Cosi Van Tutte does, Magic Flute does, but not Marriage of Figaro. Uh, it wasn't a thing yet. It will become one a bit later on. And that sets the tone really well, not because it's fast and it's rumptious and bumptious and all those other kinds of words. It's because it gives us an atmosphere of intrigue. This is taking place at a court just outside Seville with the insane pecking order that we find in, say, shows like um, 
Downton Abbey or shows like Gosford Park, where even the very servants have a really uh, strongly observed pecking order. Uh, so that's what you're going to see. That's our that's our uh, our dramatis personae, and it basically represents the society of Vienna and of Paris in um, in microcosm, presumably of Seville too. But really, this is a French story set by a Viennese to Italian music. So after the fir after the overture is complete, and you can clap after the overture, you may clap. We're going to hear a little duet. When it says little duet, Mozart calls it duettino. And this introduces us to our first characters, Figaro, who has been familiar with audiences since the Barber of Seville, and a new person, Susanna. Figaro was rewarded by the Count for helping him win his bride by being given the position of the Count's personal servant or personal valet. That sounds like a come down from being the factotum of Seville, but it would come with job security and a certain degree of prestige within the overall network of servants. And Figaro has been given permission to marry the Countess's chambermaid or personal maid, Susanna. So it's going to be their day. All of the three operas that these two creators put together have an extra title. Ours is The Madness of a Day, borrowed directly from Beaumarchais. So everything takes place during one day. So we begin in the morning. And what's happening, first of all, we're, we're opening the whole opera with servants. That would have offended people in the ruling class. Uh, they're also not, they're not, it's not a love duet. They're not talking about, you know, their plans to have children and to go have a honeymoon in Las Vegas or anything like that. They're just doing their work. Figaro is measuring the space that the, that the Count has given them to make sure that it will fit their wedding bed. And Susanna is modeling the little wedding bonnet that she has made for herself. And I'm going to play you the music and just talk a little bit about this because this has far-reaching consequences, this, this choice that Mozart has made. So Figaro's tune is somewhat militaristic with this kind of rhythm. You can see somebody marching to that. He's, he's a man of business, and he's making sure that this bed will fit into this darn room. So that is a certain, it's almost like a square dance-like rhythm. And then Susanna comes in, and her music is much more lyrical, much more song-like. Uh, in the old days, people would say, and I have a book that says this, his is masculine and hers is feminine. Uh, we're not supposed to really make those distinctions, but in 1786, that would have been understood immediately. And thus it goes with these two conflicting themes. And there's something that's very telling about this, and that is, at the end, Susanna has been trying to get Figaro to stop doing what he's doing and admire her beautiful and pretty wedding bonnet that she's made all by herself. And she finally gets him to do that. And then they both conclude the duet singing her music. And this is significant because it means that basically she is the dominant character of the two of them. Uh, and in fact, she is. Uh, Mozart and de Ponte, like Beaumarchais, are going to assert that the serving class is actually wilier, more resourceful, cleverer, and more principled than the ruling class, personified by the Count. The Countess is a lady, more about that later. Uh, but Mozart is also fond of letting us know that the women are almost always smarter than the men. And this is nowhere more evident than in this piece with Figaro and Susanna. What follows next is a passage of what is called recitativo secco. Now, uh, people do seem to like me to explain that, even if you've seen these operas before. The storytelling part of this music theater is conducted in a medium where the singers deliver the text with notes, but they are obliged to manipulate the rhythm so it sounds like somebody's speaking. If you've been to Italy before, and just walking past us is the quintessential Italian Giuseppe Pietro Roya. He just ignores us. He's, well, he's now the principal conductor of POV, so he doesn't need us anymore. Anyway, um, 
then it's a very musical language. It already sounds like singing when you hear people speak it. It also lends itself well to a fast delivery. So rather than saying, we will go to the store to buy a banana, they'll just, we'll go to the store to buy a banana. And then the uh, word seco means dry. What that is, is the dialogue that we expect to hear is sung in a speech-like rhythm, and it's accompanied by these little interjections from the harpsichord. This is a brilliant testament, you'll see it tonight, to the ingenuity of our uh, principal coach and repetiteur and harpsichordist, Kimberly Ann Bartzak, because all Mozart gives us are bass notes. And you have to play chords. You have to figure out what the chord is and play them. But also, you have to watch what's going on stage, because the director might ask you to fill in a little bit of music while somebody's doing a gesture, or to accompany that gesture. So it can be different every single night. And so uh, she's doing a fantastic job of this. So that is the medium through which most of the storytelling takes place. But we also have, of course, the aria. Uh, where would we be without arias in opera? We'd be at home, not coming to the show. Uh, so one of the great arias will take place as soon as I remember to introduce two more characters. I forgot about them. We'll, we've met Figaro and Susanna. And in that wretched of evil secco I was just describing, Susanna learns that this is the room the Count has given them for their for their wedding, for their marriage room, and she's very indignant. This is what has turned out. Uh, has anybody heard of Le Droit de Seigneur? Okay, we don't practice it anymore. Um, well, at least not officially. But this was the idea that if the servants were given permission by their boss to marry, they would, as a gift, a gesture of gratitude, give him maybe uh, a calf when it was calving season or some produce from their garden, like he wasn't rich enough to afford it himself. But Beaumarchais upped the ante a little bit, and apparently this did happen once or twice in real life. Uh, the, the, the lord of the manor could have the privilege of the first night with the new bride. Now, in the first flush of love that the Count felt for Rosina, he abolished that. But now he's gotten a bit sick of his wife, and he wants to bring it back again. So the whole opera is about Susanna and Figaro and the Countess making sure that doesn't happen. Uh, so that's what we'll hear. Um, and then we'll meet two comic characters. These are closer to being standard buffa opera comic characters, except this is by Mozart, and they are unique characters. The first one is Dr. Bartolo, who lost Susanna to the wily Figaro in the Count, so he's out for blood. And he has as his, his accomplice uh, a former servant of his named Marcelina. Now, I'm looking around the room and remembering a production we gave in 2003 that was modeled after Gosford Park. And the Marcelina of that evening is standing right there on the stairs, wonderful Rebecca Haas. And I must say, she, even now she's too young to play that role, let alone 21 years ago. Uh, it was a very good production. Anyway, Marcelina, now here's where we're reminded that we're seeing an opera, not watching a documentary. Marcelina at one point has loaned a significant amount of money to Figaro. And the terms of the loan are that if it's not paid by a, by a certain day, and of course, this is the day it's due, he has to marry her. So he's conveniently sort of put that to one side, but she's got the contract. And Dr. Bartolo figures there could not be a better way to get his own back than to force Figaro to marry his old servant. So it looks like that could happen. You'll find out in the funniest passage, there's three or four really funny passages of Wretched at Evil Secco in this piece, and in one of them that resolves itself. Uh, so going on now to some more characters. The one I'd like to introduce you to the most is one of the uh, traditions, again, that we have encountered in opera, and that is when the role of a young boy is played by a female singer. And this is actually called a trouser role, and ours is Cherubino. Doesn't that sound like a little sort of putti or seraphim, a little angel? What he is, is a festering pestilence of adolescent hormones on two legs. Um, and so he's absolutely, he's, he's, he's overcome with lust for every girl he sees. He even mentioned something about Marcelina, you know, in a, on a dark night somewhere. Uh, he's primarily in love with the Countess, but he has as his provisional girlfriend, Susanna's cousin, Barbarina. And he comes in, tears tracking, to talk to uh, Susanna, saying, the Count found me doing something naughty with Barbarina, and now he wants to um, fire me. He wants to let me go. I want to ask you, when, when the Count will even bring this up, I went to Barbarina's house, and ask yourself, what's he doing going to Barbarina's house? She's the young daughter of the gardener. 
So it's a, it's a rhetorical question. You know perfectly well what he was doing there. <laughs> anyway, um, Caravino explains this to Susanna, and he sings an aria in which we now learn how much Mozart's orchestral writing can give us an underpinning of the character's emotions. So, uh, Caravino says, I don't know what's, what's happening to me. All I can think of is love. Love is a euphemism for lust. And um, it's, he said, no matter what, he can only think of love. He can think of, uh, he, he runs hot, he runs cold. He can think of nothing but girls. And he just wants to talk about love to everyone he meets, to the flowers, to the mountains, to the fountains. And if nobody will talk to him about love, he'll talk about it with himself. Now, the tune is, is perfectly uh, appropriate for this sentiment all by itself. Now, that's a perfectly serviceable tune. It works really well. But the, it's the orchestra that gives us the under, underpinning of anxiety that this young boy is always going through. Now, that in and of itself is that's, the, that's how he feels all the time. But let's listen to the right hand of the piano, which will represent the violins. They're always off the beat. So we're watching the, the conductor. And that's actually really hard to do and stay together. So the violins are never together. Even now that we've done the piece for 200 odd years, there's always a little bit of ensemble, well, unequalness. And that is entirely appropriate to the way that Carabino's feeling as well, after all. Now I mentioned the rhythm of Figaro. Uh, there's another thing that informs this piece frequently throughout the whole work, and that is dance. Uh, there is an actual fandango danced, and while it's being danced, there's a great deal of intrigue and planning that takes place. But the dotted rhythm that Figaro has will yield its way to a minuet. Now, where did it go? And this contains, this whole scene contains some of the most pointed of um, the statements made by Figaro about the count, or in other words, the class that Beaumarchais belonged to about the king. That's very dance-like. And all the way through, we'll have dances. If it's a very regal character, it'll be a minuet like that. In other words, Mozart and de Ponte are breaking down the social barriers by giving a, dance, a minuet-like dance to a servant. But also, uh, Figaro concludes this entire act singing in that same dotted rhythm. I'm just going to explain a little bit about this particular uh, dramatic situation. so that I can, in, I can just talk a little bit about what happens after Carabino. Now, you have to see this, and it's done very well in this production. Uh, Carabino's pleading with Susanna to help him out of this predicament when who, who, should, who should we hear in the hallway but the Count making his way to Susanna's room, knowing that Figaro is no longer in it. Uh, and so Carabino has to hide. He can't escape. And so the Count comes in and immediately begins to hit on Susanna. So he, this, he's, he's, there's, no, there's no compunction. There's no uh, delicacy. He attempts to be delicate, and that makes it almost smell with odious smarminess. Uh, and then we hear another voice, and that's that weaselly music teacher of a Don Basilio. So now the Count has to hide while Carabino is also hidden, and Don Basilio comes in. And most of the humor is conducted, not all of it, but in the form of recitativo. So this will resolve itself by the Count finally saying, when he sees Carabino, OK, you're not fired, but I'm sending you into the army which is the last place Carabino wants to go. You don't get to wear fancy clothes. You don't get to wear a, a mustache. or a, he, He's you seen with a mustache. You don't get to have your hair done really nicely so the ladies will like it, because there's no ladies in the army anyway. And here is our march-like um, rhythm as Figaro taunts and teases Carabino, who, after all, has been getting a little too cozy with Susanna as well.
Um, now that tune, incidentally, appears in Don Giovanni. It appears in the scene where Don Giovanni is preparing his, his uh, dining room for his supper and his guest. And uh, he has a little band that then plays tunes from popular operas of the day. And that's what, exactly what they do. I think one of them is by Paisiello, who had written The Barber of Seville. But then they break into that one and, uh, and Don Giovanni says, oh, stop playing that. That's all you hear anywhere. I'm heartily sick of it. So that is an indication the next year of Mozart just saying, Prague, you're great. I like having you as fans. Now, a couple of other things that I wanted to mention have to do with the characters that aren't in Act One. But there is one of our timpanists right there. Uh, one, of our, um, uh, one of the sources that I like to read about when I'm discussing certainly Mozart but also Puccini operas is a wonderful writer about opera with the unlikely name Spike Hughes. He's one of those people who writes about jazz and opera. I think that's all. Uh, anyway, he points out that the Countess, we don't meet her until Act Two, uh, who is now being ignored by her husband while he goes philandering around, abandoned essentially, and also because he's philandering around, he figures she's doing the same thing. So the situation with Carabino having a crush on her is actually quite perilous. And uh, one thing she is all the way through is dignified. She is not referred to Rosina except once when her husband refers to her by her Christian name. She is Madama or La Contessa. Uh, and she always behaves with dignity even when her heart's being torn apart. I'm going to play you her music because she begins act two. And ask yourself, could this be anything but the music for a melancholy character? So even though that's in a major key, it's sad music. There's an undercurrent of sadness. And then she sings about, where did it go? Why, why has my husband done this to me? I've, I've lost the love of my life. This reminds us that the Count and the Countess are not old people. They're young people. They have been married when the Countess would have been in her teens. So she maybe should be look around 21 or 22. Uh, it can strain credulity quite a lot when the Countess is up on stage and she's visibly 55 or 60. Uh, and just because that means that Marcelina now has another dirty old woman and that so does Dr. Bartolo have another dirty old man. So they're quite youthful in this production and that's as it should be. Uh, but she is a dignified lady, as Spike Hughes puts it. So she's not going to uh, lower herself um, by behaving in an undignified way. And in fact, she, one of the things that she says when she's by herself is, how could my husband who once loved me, how could he be so nasty to me, so horrible to me, so, uh, such a traitor that I am now forced to, help, to ask my own servant for help. So that's a little hint into how much more serious this opera is on a human level as well as a political one. So the next character I want to remind you of is Barbarina. You're going to hear a lot about her, uh, or she's going to be mentioned a lot in the first act, but she doesn't come in until well after that. Uh, she is Susanna's cousin, Carabino's girlfriend, and the daughter of the gardener. And I want to tell you this, for a character that's relatively minor in terms of the length of time she sings, she gets a very beautiful aria. And I'm not going to take the time to mention every single singer you're going to encounter, but this girl is amazing in her delivery of the, of the little Barbarina aria, so I think you'll enjoy it very much. One more word about the finales. 
Act one does not have a finale, and the finales for acts two, three, and four pro proceed according to the dramaturgy, what is required by the storytelling. There's no bowing to tradition whatsoever. So the, the storytelling in each of the finales is really important and really effective. Uh, it also culminates with the count being exposed. And you'll see exactly how that happens and forced to beg for his wife's forgiveness in front of everybody else. The person we've spent the preceding 97% of the opera with is going to be humiliated by this, but he does it. And Mozart's music makes it seem profoundly genuine. And actually, it's more moving than La Boheme, as far as I'm concerned. When she said, so graciously, she says, I am kinder than you, and I will pardon you. And then everybody sings this wonderful uh, ode to love, and it's all curing potential. Let's go and celebrate the marriage of Figaro and Susanna. There'll be a feast, there'll be drinking, there'll be fireworks. And then we left to ask ourselves, I wonder if the Count's going to be able to keep his word, that we'll, he'll now be forever faithful to the Countess. Mozart makes us want to believe that. Um, our own logic makes us understand it's quite unlikely. But in any case, in the year after Mozart died, Beaumarchais wrote the third play of that trilogy. It's called The Guilty Mother, La Mère Coupable. And in it, uh, the Count has sent Carabino off to war, but also he has begun his philandering ways again. And the Countess has said to herself, OK, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. So she goes ahead and has a little fling with Carabino. And then he goes off to war where he is killed. But the Countess is bearing his child. And that's how it ends. Um, and you know, I say good for you, Rosie. I hope you enjoyed it. And, but the thing is, Mozart was dead before that was written. So it's up to you. You can decide whether you think the Count really is going to mend his ways or not. I know you'll enjoy this very much with the wonderful playing of the Victoria Symphony and this terrific cast, as well as the costumes, sets, and direction. And thank you again so very much for coming to spend some of your evening with me. Enjoy the show. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>